relax, and let your thoughts drift away in a stressless, the ultimate recliner. Designed to support you perfectly in any position. Relax your body, free your mind in a stressless. Come, experience stressless at Enbow Furniture in Cornelius. Hi everyone, I'm Bill Rosinski and welcome to another edition of Sports Night at South End Brewery. We're here at South End Brewery on South Boulevard, just outside Uptown Charlotte. A lot of racing to talk about on our show tonight. And we begin with a gentleman who I got to know back in 1995 when he was writing a radio television column for the Charlotte Observer. That's when I came to town as the voice of the Carolina Panthers. Within a year he was covering NASCAR. And he's one of the best insiders in the business from the Charlotte Observer and from Sirius Radio. David Poole. David, good to see you again. Hi, Bill. How are you? Uh, it's been a long time yeah. since uh, that conversation we had back in 1995, hasn't it? It's a lot of round and round left turns <laughs> I've seen since then. This is my 11th year of covering NASCAR, uh, so it's, it's, been, it's, been quite a, it's been quite a ride. Uh, let's talk about the first time we met. You were doing a radio TV column, right. so how did, that, how did you get that and then move on into NASCAR? Well, I'd come to the Observer from, I'd worked in Gastonia for a long time, had left, went to West Palm Beach, Florida, came back to the Observer in 1990, and we sort of stole the Rudy Marchke column idea out of USA Today. A lot of papers were doing local TV radio, and for Charlotte, it made a lot of sense because there was a lot of television coming out of here. Patty Wheeler had a NASCAR production company based here. Uh, Raycon with all the college basketball it was doing. The Panthers, the, 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 back then the Hornets. So there was a lot of local news involving TV radio. So I got them to let me start writing a column as a way to sort of sort of feed my writing Jones while I was working on the desk. Well, in, the, in late 96, after the Olympics in Atlanta that summer, I had written a daily column, and people thought that I needed to do more writing and less desk work. I, guess, I think it was a, uh, maybe my desk work wasn't so great anymore. But anyway, um, Tom Higgins retired at the end of the 96 season. Well, as you well remember, that was the year the Panthers went to the NFC Championship game. And I always accuse the Observer of not of just getting so caught up in the Panthers, they forgot they had to hire a racing writer. So literally the day that the Panthers played the Packers in this championship game, somebody at the Observer that night realized that the, the London Speedway Media Tour began Monday morning and we didn't have anybody to go on it. So they called me at home and said, can you be at the airport at six o'clock in the morning? They're gonna fly to Texas to see the new race back in Texas. Can you go and we'll get somebody to cover it the rest of the week? Well, that one day turned into the rest of the media tour and six weeks later I was in Daytona for the Daytona 500 as the Observer's beat writer. And I always laugh, you know, they think, I'm pretty sure they figured, well, we'll stick this guy on racing and, uh, until we can find somebody who can do it better, and I guess they're still looking. That's the way I'm looking at it, I guess. <laughs> well, you, you've certainly done a great job with it, and uh, I'm, I've always wondered, you know, I, when I became the voice of, of, of a couple of NFL teams, it takes a while for the people who you work, in, in my situation, for, and the people you would work with day in, day out, to feel comfortable with you. Oh, yeah. When, when, how long did it take for you to feel comfortable as, as a writer covering NASCAR? <clears throat> well, I had, I had the advantage of being the Observer's beat writer because these guys, a lot of these guys live around here, and they know the Observer is serious about covering NASCAR. I and mean, we've been covering every race since about 1965. I mean, you can't cover, you can't not cover NASCAR in the, for the Charlotte paper because, you know, basically the sport lives here. So, and the work that Tom Higgins had done and the relationships that he had built, opened a lot of doors for me. And uh, so that helped. And then of course, once you start doing that, they, you have to sort of do the job in the way that they trust. And I had a couple of very interesting sort of moments early in my tenure at the Observer. Uh, Jeff Gordon won the Daytona 500 that year. And uh, as he was walking out of the press box, he said, look forward to reading your story in the paper tomorrow. And I thought, you know, that's interesting. But in Charlotte, my newspaper is the one that's thrown around the break rooms and when I write something they don't like, outlined in yellow highlighter and posted up on the bulletin board. When Bobby Labonte won his championship in February of that year, they had a really bad Daytona 500. Their crew basically just had a horrible day. And just as a little you know, one-line thing in my paper, I said his crew looked more like the Keystone Cops than, a, than the championship contenders. Well, in November, when they were about to win the championship, and I went to visit their shop, on every bulletin board I saw, there was that clip with my <laughs> comment. So, you, you know, you. You, you understand that these, these guys are reading what you write, 
and you better be right and you better be fair. And that's all they really want you to do, I think, is be right and be fair. Yeah, it's interesting. It reminds me of the Nicholas story in 86 at the Masters, yeah. a writer for the... Uh, Tom McCollister, yes. who became my best friend in racing the first couple of years. Is that right? Yeah. yeah Tom was covering we'll... racing for the Atlanta Constitution Journal, and, and he tells that story great. He, you know, you, I don't mean to interrupt, but Tom wrote right. that Nicholas was done, washed right. up, right. not going to win in his preview to the Masters. And, uh, of course, Jack shoots 29 on the back nine on Sunday or whatever it was. <laughs> and, and after it was over with, McCollister walked in the interview room late, and there was one seat left front row middle jack had saved it for him and so <laughs> when tom walked in jack said no we got your seat down here tom come down front so the, the the payoff of the story was the next year in 87 tom's at the uh tournament players championship in, in ponte Vedra beach and jack's playing horrible again and nicholas sees tom on the practice tee and says tom i might need your help again at augusta <laughs> and so, tom said sorry jack watts has already asked <laughs> Great so, story. Yeah. And, the, and the bottom line with it is as much as athletes and front office people tell you, we don't read that stuff. That's a lie. Yes, they do. <laughs> That's a lie. And, you know, the, in racing, the, these guys know stuff, you know, I mean, they see stuff on the Internet before I see it. I mean, it, it, and ask me about it. Uh, there, there's been a, hundreds of times that I've been asked questions about stuff by race car drivers who've seen stuff, and I'll have to say, you have to tell me where you saw it, because I haven't seen that. I mean, there are some of these guys that, that spend more time weren't reading uh, internet sites than I do, and I'm on it a lot. So, David Pool, our guest here on uh, Sports Night at South End Brewery. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, some, some things making news in NASCAR this year. And uh, as we do this show, the car of tomorrow will be unveiled at Bristol in competition. Right. Uh, your thoughts on it? Is this good for the sport? And how, will, will this change points wise what we see, or is it still going to be the same? The Hendricks and the Rouches and well, I think there's several questions there. The car tomorrow is designed to be a safer race car, uh, and I think it will accomplish that. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit taller, a little bit wider. The driver's seat is moved over, and it's not really so that you notice in the middle of the car, but it's over about four inches from the door. So they could build a few more for the driver. Or there's more stuff between him and the outside of the car. There's there's energy energy absorbing foam. There's more roll bars. There's a different kind of structure where the roll bars start out and sort of come in so that if, the, if you hit, we have a driver's side impact, the, the impact starts here and then moves down and it kind of spreads out the shock and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the safety aspects of it I think are good because com the competitive aspects of it, are the, that's the $64,000 question. Will this car three years from now be racier than the current car we have now? Because it's going to take some time for the teams to get used to adjusting on this car, to working on this car, to making it better. And what we see early on is not going to be what the end result is. But as we get to the end result, can, can guys race side by side? Can they pass each other without making each other loose on these mile and a half racetracks when they're going 185, 190 miles an hour? Because that's what we're having now is it's hard to race side by side because of the aerodynamic forces with these bullets these teams are building. You know, if, you get, if, if this car's here and this car's here, this car doesn't have enough air on its nose to handle properly. No matter what you do to the car mechanically, the air is just not there to make it work. Well, the idea with the car tomorrow is to lessen that dependence on the aero, aero effects. And it has a, a thing around the front that's called a splitter that looks like a cow catcher. And it's a different looking thing. And then it has a wing on the back as opposed to a spoiler. So you've got this wing sticking up in the air about this far, and, and it's not connected to the rear deck lid. It's got a little uh, trailing arm thing up there that, that holds the wing on. So it's gonna be a different look. How will it change the competitive balance of the sport? I don't know that it'll change it at all. The idea is, is that a team will need fewer race cars to run a season because you won't have to have a special car for Dover, a special car for Talladega, a special car for Martinsville. You, theoretically, at least, you'll be able to run this, these cars at more different racetracks and you just do slight adjustments on it. If that works out, it could help the smaller teams to, to a degree with the, with the cost-wise. But at first, at least, I think that the teams that have the money and the resources and the people and the skills to adapt fastest are going to are going to be the ones who succeed fastest, and that's most likely going to be your top tier teams: the Hendricks, the Roushes, the Gibbs, and, and the Childress and the guys like that. All right, now after Bristol, we're going by points. Now, what happened last year as far as people are going to get into this race? year? That's right. After right. Bristol, uh, Jeff Burton says that this this number should go up to like 43 because of. Uh, the amount of money sponsors pay, 
the amount of people employed by these NASCAR teams, does he have a legitimate point? Well, if you had a team, you would think he has a very legitimate point. I mean, basically, that's a, that's a, a have wanting to, to maintain the, the status quo. Fans, for, it's my, based on my reaction that I get from fans, they hate the top 35. They think it ought to be the fastest 43 cars every week. If, if 60 show up, the fastest 43 cars make the race, even if that means Dale Jr. doesn't make the race because he, he, has, he blows a tire. Well, NASCAR can't do that. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has to race on Sundays. So there has to be some level of protection for the top tier teams. What, what the top 35, which basically means if you're in the top 35 in car or points, you're guaranteed a spot in the next week's race. What that does is sort of create a de facto franchising situation where you can go to a sponsor, you can go to an investor and say, we are guaranteed a spot in the next 20, first 26 races of this year, the, all the races this year, as long as we stay in the top 35. That allows you to market the team, to plan hospitalities. You know, if you're Michael Waltrip right now and you're not making races, if you bring 500 Napa people to the race in Atlanta and, they, and you don't make the race, now you've got 500 customers asking, what's wrong with your race team? That's not what you're in the business for. You want, you know, if you're, so if you had 43 franchise teams and everybody was guaranteed a spot, and the only way that Bill Rosinski Racing could get into the sport would be to buy a spot from an existing team owner, then that gives the team owner's franchise a value that it doesn't have now. You'd have to pay your way into the sport by paying the team owner for his franchise as opposed to just showing up at the racetrack, building a race car, and trying to get his spot by outrunning it. All right, I want to put you in the hot seat now. I'm going to okay. throw a couple of names at you and just give me your reaction. And let me start with Toyota. Slow start. I mean, I think that even they would tell you that they've started slower in NASCAR than they would have hoped. Uh, I think, of, you know, it's, it's going to take a while for them to get their car and their engines and their drivers and their teams faster. Very much like the car tomorrow, what Toyota will look like in three years is very, not very, will be very different than what it looks like today in NASCAR. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and DEI. Uh, the biggest story in the sport right now. Um, if he goes, if he goes somewhere else, DEI is in big trouble. I don't think he will go somewhere else. But I think him and his, his sister Kelly are, are are sort of this is their this is their all in hand. You know, they've decided. Okay, we, we think we now have the chips to go in to go all in against Teresa and get control of our father's company. And make no mistake, that's what this is about. This is not about anything else than Dale and Ther Dale Jr. And, and Kelly wanting to run the company that their father built and not having to go through Teresa to do it. That, that's, that's what this is about. This is not about anything else other than Dale and Kelly wanting to run the show and not have Teresa around to run it. Finally, Bruton Smith. Um, he is a guy who's not willing, not afraid to spend his own money. He sp just spent millions and millions of dollars at Las Vegas reshaping a racetrack that, that fans have criticized for being too flat and boring into what's going to be eventually one of the most exciting tracks on the sport. And he's built the new modern template for the inside of a racetrack with his neon garage there. It's like a, a theme park for race fans in the middle of his racetrack. Uh, Bristol is his baby. You know, with Bristol Motor Speedway is, a, is, is something that any sports fan of any sport in this country should see once in their lives. I mean, Bristol Motor Speedway is on a par with Augusta National, the Kentucky Derby, Yankee Stadium, Lambeau Field, things you have to see before you're dead as a sports fan, Bristol's one of them. And that's all because of what Bruton, the money and the, the, the vision Bruton's had for places like that. David Poole, the Charlotte Observer. You can also hear him uh, mornings, the Morning Drive. That's a good title uh, on Sirius Satellite Radio. David, always a pleasure. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you, Bill. David Poole with us. More to come on Sports Night here at South End Brewery. Stay right there. Sports Night at South End Brewery is brought to you by South End Brewery and Smokehouse, offering fine cuisine, custom crafted beers, and the number one microbrewery in the South. And by Imbo Furniture, Scandinavian and contemporary designs. Relax and let your thoughts drift away in a stressless, the ultimate recliner. Designed to support you perfectly in any position. Relax your body, free your mind in a stressless. Come, experience stressless at Enbow Furniture in Cornelius. You don't have to be this fit to read Charlotte Health and Fitness magazine, but... 
Let Charlotte Health and Fitness Magazine help you maximize your active lifestyle. Every month, CHF readers enjoy features on the best places to get fit, look great, and have fun. CHF is now available for home or office delivery. For a limited time, visit chfmag.com and sign up to receive your complimentary copy today. Welcome to Stressless, the recliner that lets you create your own personal comfort zone. With a smooth reclining glide system that eases your body into the perfect position for total relaxation. Plus full lumbar support and a headrest that adjusts automatically. Stressless. Relax your body. Free your mind. Come. Experience Stressless at Enbow Furniture in Cornelius. Sports Night at South End Brewery is brought to you by South End Brewery and Smokehouse, offering fine cuisine, custom crafted beers, and the number one microbrewery in the South. And by Imbo Furniture, Scandinavian and contemporary designs. Welcome back to Sports Night here at South End Brewery. Uh, we continue our focus on auto racing, but this is a little change of pace. This is NHRA, and we're going to talk to the guy who drives the dragster. Snap on Tools is the logo. And uh, let me tell you something, I've, I really had to do my homework on this one. Doug Herbert is with us, and Doug, you've been driving on this. Uh, is, is driving the right